ீவனிங்வரிபடி Thanks for joining. So uh, we will start off the session today. So that way is my nowadays. Okay. So we looked at the Patanjali Yoga Sutra. We look into chapter number one, two, and right now today we are at three, and uh, next week we will be finishing three. Right. So if anybody want to go to Kaivalya Pada, direct. right so uh, so that's why i said um, you must go through at least chapter number 2 and chapter number 3 and then chapter number 1 or at least uh, chapter number 1 itself if you have a uh, good yogic knowledge about these concepts chapter number 1 would help you otherwise you start from chapter number 2 and then 3 whatever we have done then you can read again chapter number 1 then you would be able to pick it up right that's not an issue right so uh, in chapter number 1 we talked about what is yoga so then uh, how is the mind operating what are the key components in the mind how it operates and then what are the types of uh, thoughts that we are generating and we looked into our karma indriya and the senses what are the senses eye ear nose tongue and the skin and the mind right so do not expect your nose to do what your ear is doing we cannot expect what your eyes are doing through your mouth right so these sense organs have one particular job same way do not expect your mind right mind has a job what is mind doing always so mind is connected with all the senses so there is an external object you have the particular indriya or the sense and then you have the mind so it will always give it a nama and a rupa right always when you look outside you want to give a name to something right if you don't get a name when you look out for something you become frustrated then that becomes the mind's job to go and find a rupa and then name it then what is what is it once you find something that's a rupa then you want to give it a name nama right then basically that particular nama rupa will have an impact on your mind so the memory will have a little so it goes to your memory then what happens you start to compare that i like it i do not like it that's fairer and this is darker this looks better that looks uglier so always these two sides will be assigned to them but then what happens then once you assign the two sides you will start comparing oh yeah i have seen the same thing some time back that was better this is not good right even a person she looks nicer she looks taller she looks beautiful right beautiful to what to a tree right no you are comparing people right so if you imagine if there is only one woman in this world um she is everything then you will call him call her the god because there are no two women to compare right if there is only one man in this world that would be god right if there is a particular type of animal there is only one that animal have in this world even without a mind people will go and name him as the god because there's only one of them right but as far as you have more you start start to compare so when you compare then what happens again so you will again give yeah this is good i understand what he's saying or oh, i don't like it or oh, i prefer it so likewise you will start keep on giving you know first you identify name it 
like dislike it goes to the memory box again return compare criticize you do all these things so that is the job of the mind so if any one of you here is trying to basically stop that it's like you are trying to stop your mouth from eating you can't stop your mouth from eating you can't stop your ears from hearing so you can't stop your mind from processing right so this is where we identify two things right so if you see right now let's say how many people we have here right today i don't know how to check it. yeah seven people right so um, if i ask you are uh, the seven of yours world is the same answer is no it's absolutely different 100% different from one to another so it depends on from the time that you were born what sort of definitions were you fed with that's mother that's father that's amma that's appa that's uh, again amma that's tata right that is mata this is pita right so if a indian person a hindu a hindi speaking person and myself are there i call the same person tata 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 and this person will call pita 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 right so for me he is just making some irritating noise for him i am making some irritating noise because he don't get it right so the language creates we learned this in sutra 1 right language can make something true and it can define it as false it can always take you into a different way the language right so we talked about all these things right so the world is different right what you want is not what the other person wants what you prefer is not what the other person prefers so it depends on how your impressions are being built right good so then uh, so those type of things are what we are talking in chapter number 1 so in chapter number 2 we call it uh, sadhana path sadhana what is sadhana basically your exercises which you are supposed to do right so sadhana path we talk about five things so this is the raja yoga approach uh, yama niyama asana pranayama pratyahara so what are yama niyama do's and don'ts moral obligations and some things like uh, rules right so so these are so now for these moral obligations there is no good and bad so don't lie is it better to lie is it bad to lie don't lie right don't kill don't steal because when you do all these things the intention that you have in your mind creates a karma that's why so when these things are get these things create karma these things get some scar right so then you will have a life always there is a life there. why embedded in karma embedded in samskara is the tanha that we have right so let me ask you a question right you can answer let me make you able to even unmute but answer has to be one word right so right so the question is there is a flower right so i have a great desire to that flower i love to see that flower for a guy let's call it a bmw car or a ferrari right let's call it something affordable let's say bmw at least you see those in the road no? ferrari you don't see right so um you like that car or you love that flower right so is it tanha is it desire now everybody is scared to answer well it may not be tanha it right? may be something else let's not answer right is it tanha every time early morning when i walk wake wake up early in the morning i run to see my rose roses i love i run to see the roses or i run to see the orchids or i run to see whatever the flower that you likes or you run to see your pet dog tortoise anyone right so is it tanha hmm 
Okay. Let me ask the question in a different way. So now somebody comes and say, that is Tanha. You uh, Every day morning you wake up and you want to see this dog. Otherwise your day is not good. You don't feel good, right? It's, it's not feeling very good, right? So then of course, yeah, that is Tanha. Right? So because we say Tanha, now your this thing is, okay, I don't like it. I don't like BMW. I don't like roses. I don't like it anymore. I don't. I don't. Right? Is that a tanha? <laughs> right? Now these days we everybody say one name and we say uh, we don't want you. We don't want you. We don't want you. Get out. Go. Right? So is that tanha? It has to be the opposite of tanha, right? We don't like no. So there are two types in tanha, the trishna. One is called vibhava tanha. One is called bhava tanha. Bhava tanha is you see something, you like it. Right? So for you to see something, first you identify you as a person. Once you identify you as a person, then you see an object and you like it. That is the permanence, or oh, it's it's happening. It's there, the the, the 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 identification. So there is an identified object, and you believe it's there. So that is we call bhavatanha. Then somebody gives you a lecture, and you say, no, you should not like roses. You should not like cars. You should become a monk. You should not like anything. You should hate people. I right? don't like politics. All these things, right? Then you call that again the other shade of tanha, which is called the vibhava tanha. Meaning, you like to hate it. So for you to like to hate something, you believe that exists. For you to identify something existing, you have an existence. Right? So right now, whole country has a vibhava tanha over one name. So that is also tanha. So we all... We, Everybody liked, we should not say we all, then I'm also counted, right? I should be very, you know, middle path, right? So, because this is going on the internet. <laughs> so, everybody right now have a tanha. Right? It's tanha to hate. It's like this. You know the word bitching? Who likes to bitch about somebody? Right? And that is much fun, right? Rather than uh, praising somebody, this person is somebody like this, like this person, this person. Likewise, rather than that, why don't we like to you know, bitch about some This person, you know what he did to me? And then I tell my story. And the other person, yeah, 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 that is true. He did the same thing to me, right? And you know what? He did the same thing to that other person who lives in that house, this house, blah, blah, blah. right? So why you do that if you don't have a particular tanha? You do that because you have a tanha against it. So for it or against it, tanha is a tanha. Right? So these type of things, you should now start to learn. Right? So in Patanjali Yoga Sutra, we can define everything. We can tell it. I can tell you, this is what Patanjali says. Hey, look here, these are the sutra. This is what Patanjali is saying. That's it. Right? But you should pick one word and read at least a month about it. You should read at least a day about it and then wait for another week, read another day about it, wait for another week, read another day about it. Same, just take one uh, word, right? which is important. Otherwise, because why should you wait for a week? Then it will internalize. Otherwise, you are an intellectual expert. Right, but you don't practice anything, right? So that is what we learn through Patanjali Yoga Sutra, right? So anything you take, anything, any dharma, any philosophy, unless you do that, you will become an intellectual expert on the philosophy, right? But you will not become a uh, this one, right? So there is a nice Zen story, right? I'm telling these things. I want to go to the topic, but uh, you know get into the park, right? So, 
There's a Zen story. So there is a teacher and a student. So the teacher teaches very well. And the student got enlightened. And the student saw that the teacher has not got enlightened. But he teaches everything very well. Right? So what he did is once the, the teacher can actually um, create things in front of you through his chitta power. Right? He can create things in front of you. So then he said, uh, okay, the student said, uh, Guruji, can you do me a favor? I would like to see a, a beautiful lake. Can you create it in front of me? He said, yeah, why not? Let's create it. So he created a nice, beautiful lake. Then he said, can you create an elephant coming out of water? Right? And he said, yes, 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 can. Right? So big tusker coming out of water now from the lake. Now can you create, this elephant is coming after you. Then he said, okay, fine, he created. And in seconds, the teacher started running. Right? So what happened is, basically, the teacher got illusioned with his own lie. Whatever the lie you told, now you yourself is scared. Right? So the mind also operates something like that. Right? You take a thought, you take something to your mind, because of that very thought, either you will cry, either you will lose your sleep, either you will laugh. So you yourself is basically acting to the same thing that you put into your head. Right? So what happens is, what Patanjali says in chapter number three is, learn to bring the mind to one point. So when you say one point, how to bring the mind to one point? Because there are so many things are going on, right? So many things are happening. These are thoughts. But there is a residual, right? So once you take off all the thoughts, there is a real self, which in Hinduism we call them Purusha, Atman in Tamil. Or in uh, Buddhism, what do we call it? The super consciousness. Right? The real self, the consciousness. So, real self doesn't do anything. Remember the security camera we said, we talked about, right? The real self is like a CCTV camera or like a third down file. It's just a witness. doesn't do anything. So, what we should start to realize is, we whatever we do, if we do it in consciousness, right? If we do it consciously, we see everything happening in our head in a bird's eye view. Right? So there was a girl. You saw the girl. Now you like the girl. So you again turned back and looked at the girl. Now you're dreaming about the girl. Where did I find her? What time I found her in the bus stop or the train station? Tomorrow I should go at the same time. I should be able to find her, but I don't really like her. But you know, it should be nice to see her. Right? Some sort of thing. So, when that is happening, what you should do is, you should understand, okay, this is what your mind is doing. Mind saw something, now he is creating thoughts, now you want to go after that thought. That is consciousness. That is the CCTV's job. That is the third umpire's job. When things go wrong, when things become out of control, you go to the third umpire and ask for it. It's like a black box of a uh, cockpit. Right? So, Right now, even if you close your eyes, what you need to understand is that somebody is chattering. I hear that in my head, right? And then there's a computer. My eyes see a computer. So as a computer, I have given a naming to that, right? So just if you see something, you just saw that. If you hear something, you just heard that. If you smell something, you just smelled it. If somebody touch you, just a touch, right? Don't try to figure out, is it a cat? Is it a woman? Is it a man? Is it a dog? Don't try to figure it out. Right? Then, oh, is it a, it's a dog. Which dog? My dog. Why not the other one? Why this one? Who put that dog out of the kennel? Maybe my mother is out. Then you start, you know, going with another road. 
right? So from where we stopped? So we said, so basically we talked a concept called Samyama. What is Samyama? Is basically the discipline that you have to practice this one-pointedness of your mind or being in consciousness. We see here, right? See here, Atman, being in consciousness, Purusha, right? So when you are there, right, if you can maintain your focus to something, Patanjali says, right, you can understand even the structures of anything, any object what you see, then what you actually see is when you don't give a naming, when you don't give a value to it, what you actually see is, is it the, basically the elements? Right? It's just the elements, just the elements, right? Is it a hard thing, um, you know, earth, what are the five elements, right? Fire, earth, air, water. So something like that. That's all. In Buddhism, these elements are a little different. In Hinduism, elements are a little different, right? But element is element. That's the common fact. Right? It doesn't matter, right? So whatever you see, if you are in full consciousness, so if you are in full consciousness, if you are looking at your mind, Whenever you see something, you know, okay, the eye is seeing something and now a name is given to that. But what actually happens is you just saw the elements. Right? So, when you pay your attention maximum to that, you actually can understand the structure or how it is being built. Right? So, on the same way, when you have the full focus on the sun, you can actually understand the solar system. So imagine there's something called astrology, right? So this astrology, we are for sure, we know by the time the astrology was written down in Veda, right? Vedas and all these things, people didn't have rockets to fly to the sky, right? But they had a superior consciousness. So they basically focused on the sun. And then in the Vedas, it's written, it's even said uh, the Milky Way is a direct translation from the Veda. Lord Vishnu is sleeping on the ocean of milk. So that's how they even came up with the word Milky Way. Who is Vishnu? The, uh, what do you call Rudra, sorry, uh, Brahma, Vishnu and Rudra. The Mm, uh, basically what do you call the birth and you stay there and you die right so basically this whole life system is what you call as Vishnu right so one would really focus on the sun's energy and you can understand how the stars are being prepared right because now this cannot be done by a person who have n number of thoughts in his head Right? If you don't have anything, you are actually in the full consciousness. When you focus on the sun, you and the sun become one. That is what you call as samadhi. You become one with the thing that you focus on. Right? On the same way, Patanjali says, if you focus on the moon, the yogi will know the position of the stars. If you focus on the polar star, then the yogi knows the cause of destiny. Right? By Samyama on the navel acquires a perfect knowledge of the disposition of human body. Right? How the body has been made up of. An example, Ayurveda. Ayurveda is being accepted across the world. When Western medicine does not work, people come to Ayurveda. And Western medicine is seen like it's a temporary remedy or painkiller, but Ayurveda is seen like a long-term fix. Right? So how people do Ayurveda, you will take some leaves, you will take some seeds, crush, 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 and then you put it. So if you have an eye problem, right side eye, you will apply the medicine to the left side toe. How does that work? And you can actually get rid of this cataract and everything. Even right now, there are uh, people who can do that. Right? I have experience. I have recommended people to go to such uh, Ayurvedic doctors and they have, you know, removed their specs and the cataract and everything got cured. Right? So, how is it possible? 
right now, even right now, people can't understand how that's possible. Right? There are no medicines for certain things. So these are the yogic powers used by the yogis, right? And then written on them. Especially Patanjali writing this. He is an Ayurvedi, he is a literate, and then he is into yoga. So especially coming that from Patanjali, that has even authenticity. Right? Then yeah, Patanjali says, by Samyama on the pit of the throat, Keshari Mudra, the yogi becomes uh, overcomes the hunger and thirst. Just uh, you can actually try this. Whenever you are hungry, right? Let it let be let you be hungry. Right? You be hungry, and you basically focus on from your tongue, right? You have your tongue. What's the feeling at your tongue right now? And then go beyond, go beyond, go beyond. Observe your throat region. Observe your the, the down throat region. Right? If you keep focus here and observe what is happening to the to a level that you can even feel the pulse of your blood along with the heartbeat and everything. Uh, at a point you will feel like you know you don't need to eat. Right? So this is how the monks, the yogis in the forest, they survive. Otherwise, have you ever heard somebody went to do meditation and died without food? We never hear that. Right? So, that's how it happened. Then, Samyam on the Kurmanadi, the pit of the throat, the yogi can make his body and mind firm and immobile like a tortoise. Can make it really strong. Right? So, you may be understanding when we do certain yoga asana also. So, we say you focus on here the Vishuddhi, we focus on Anahata, right? we focus on Manipura. So certain practices when you do, after one year of practice or six months of practice, just go back. Now, even right now, we started yoga classes with you guys like one year back, last year, August. If you see what are the differences has happened to you, you must really, you know, just note down and see. Certain things that you thought are impossible are possible now. Right? Who taught the leg will, leg will bend from the hip to the other side? That was never in the dictionary. But does it bend? Yes. Right. And then you come to certain asanas like uh, what do you call Dhanurasana. Right. Maximum Dhanurasana. You can actually, you can even make your ears stop hearing. Right. Certain asanas like there is a Gandha Berunda asana. Right, the two-faced eagle or something. Yeah, so it's it's like this: uh, legs are here and the head is here. So when you come to the asana, basically the hearing will go off, something like that. You can experience these things, extreme asana. Right. So likewise, when you really focus on certain parts, when you put your samyama on certain nadis, certain energy centers, certain parts of the body, you can get consciously, you can understand about it. Right? Then by performing Samyama 32 on the light of the crown of the head, Jnana Chakra, right? The yogi has visions of perfected being. Excuse me, right? So the yogi has visions of perfected beings, meaning, so normally we say here is a Sahasra Chakra, right? So through your chakras, if you can bring your energy outside the body, you actually connect with the superior knowledge. Right? We also, in Buddhism, we call it dhyana and all. So you can actually go there. So we said that you can, um, there are like you know, how the radio frequencies work. Right? That is a popular example. So radio frequency is already there. Now, can you listen to a radio right now? No. But if you come to an ability where you can tap even a radio frequency in the air, you should be able to hear that. Something like that, the knowledge is everywhere. The superior knowledge is everywhere. It's just that we are not being able to reach that to a level that we can read it. Right? So does this make sense then? Right? Then, through the faculty of spiritual perception, the yogi becomes the knower of all knowledge. 
So, with the perception, if you go there, then you have the knowledge, right? Knowledge, so you, you there's a light. You learn about this light, how this light has been developed and everything, who developed it first, which country exported it, which country imported it, from where we got this particular component. Now that can be knowledge, right? But through a yogi's samyama, what you gain is the wisdom. When you look at the light, you see the elements only. Right? You see the elements, you see it's there, it's not there. Right, the impermanence nature of it. So you don't give any value to it. You don't get cling on to it. The bhava part is gone. Right? Then, I will go these things a little faster. But when it comes to chapter 4, I will slow down again. It has only 32 uh, sutras. But one sutra, we can talk a month about it. Right? Because that is something you should really start to work on. Right? So these are powers for, for here to come. You have to start from somewhere. Right? So it talks about the mind and everything. Right. Then the 34th Sutra, he is telling by Samyama, be very careful with this. By Samyama on the region of the heart, the yogi acquires a thorough knowledge of the contents and tendencies of consciousness. So where is your consciousness? Right, where is uh, what is the citadel of your mind is in, in your heart. Every blood atom has the consciousness, but it says, even in Buddhism, even in Hinduism, Advaita, right? The mind, the house of the mind is here, the heart. So, you focus on that, you basically are in consciousness. Right now, how to focus? Okay, I have a heart. Which is there? Is that? Is it on the right side, left side? No, 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 not like that, right? So you basically need to go into deeper, 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 deeper meditation. Then only you really focus on the mind. When you focus on the mind, in the sense you are focusing on the place where the uh, mind is residing, right? By Samyama, the yogi easily differentiates between the intelligence and the soul, which is real and true. Now, I think out of what we discussed, the few sutras today, this is extremely important because this is something you can understand. We all can understand. We all can experience, right? So by Samyama, so what is Samyama? Now you have to learn the meditation, right? You should be able to keep your mind now. If you start at 8 a.m. to focus on your breath, at 9 a.m. also you should be focusing on your breath. Not it has gone somewhere else, right? So fully focus on that. Thoughts can come. That's okay. Your focus is something. See, it's like there is a ground full of people. But if you are focusing on a person who is wearing a red color hat, you keep on focusing on that person. When a girl walks next to him, you should not bring the focus and you should not go there. Right? If at all, initially what happens is there is the person who is wearing the red hat, which is the breath. Then one person goes closer to him. Then you feel like, oh, was it my brother? Right? And then you suddenly go with that thought. Initially what you need to do is when you go with that thought, again you need to bring back the awareness to the red hat which is the breath. So that's what we do in the early in the morning, right? I, of course, in my yoga classes, <laughs> I now increase the time that we meditate, right? Otherwise, it just become an exercise class. We should go parallelly, right? So you see the red hat, that is your breath, right? Whenever your mind goes away, you bring it back, right? But on the same time, you know, you understand, okay, there are so many other things are also going on, but you focus on to this, Right? So, if you learn the Samyama, you actually understand the intelligence and the soul. Right? Intelligence in the sense, when somebody is talking, you can, you just see somebody is just blabbering. Right? He may be talking a lot of, you know, important things, knowledge, science and everything. Right? But you see basically whatever he's talking is basically the impermanence of it, the elements of what he's been made out of, 
right? You see the real reality of it. When you see something, see the reality. When you hear something, see hear the reality. When you are seeing something and hearing something, there is no reality. Reality is silence only. Right? Whatever you right now, I'm talking in English. You and one would say, okay, that is a great lecture. Give it to somebody who don't understand English. Just bullshitting. Right? It doesn't have any value to that. So hearing, you hear the truth. Right? So then, basically, whatever you see, you see the real, real of it. Whatever you hear, now you see a person, you get attracted to the person, and then you want to own the person. At the end, understand it's just an element, right? And it's just a thought. It's just a thought that you, first of all, perceive from your eyes. You saw the person, oh, love at first sight. Then you hear she's gossiping or blah, 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 blah into your ears and her, her voice feels like, you know, a soothing medicine. I'll give it six months, right? Her smell, wow, every time I feel her smell, I feel alive. All these are from your sensory organs. You gather and your mind give a value to that. And now it goes to your memory lake, right? So every time you basically keep on processing the memories, memories, and then creating more of this thing, right? What if, you know, what if um, she go with somebody else? Then you get angry, right? We need to put some controls over it, put a firewall in front of her, right? Something like that. So nobody can come. Something like that. So basically, these are all, at the end of the day, all our thoughts. Your mother is a thought, father is a thought, son is a thought, daughter is a thought. That's the best way to put it. Right? So, why you call your mother a mother? There is a person whom you had been fed as mother, mother, mother. Because of that, because of the tradition, in your mind, you have given a tremendous value to that person as a mother. So when you give tremendous value to a person, when the person leaves you, you will be left out of tremendous pain, tremendous sorrow. But if you don't give a value to a person, let the person go, come, be here, be there, it doesn't matter. Right? At the end of the day, if you don't get this, you will have a next life. Right? This, this, this birth, you will be the husband. Next birth, you will be the wife. Right? Or the son, or the mother, or the grandma, or the dog, or the anybody. Right? So, through that spiritual perception, the yogi acquires the divine faculties of hearing, touch, vision, taste, and smell. So, if you understand what you smell from your nose is just a thought that finally comes to your head, right? You will lose the smell of everything. Right? Losing the smell of everything is basically this losing the smell of delusion. A flower is a delusion. Right? So if you lose that delusion, then they say, now you smell right. Now you smell the real in that. Right? Or now you see the reality in that. So with Samyama, if you come to Dharana a little bit, Dhyana, longer time of concentration. Samadhi, perfect concentration where you lose yourself and you become that particular thing. Right? Then you basically, the food doesn't have a smell to you. Right? But you will always feel whenever you are walking somewhere, if a tiger is coming behind you, you will see the tiger. You will feel the tiger coming. So you know the danger is coming and then you know how to act on it. Otherwise, what happens is the tiger comes and eats you, still you don't know because you are stuck in your own little dream world. Right? So they say with some memory, you will get the superior faculties or divine faculties of hearing touch, vision, taste and smell. This is what Buddha had. This is what Shankaracharya had. This is what uh, Ramana Maharishi had. This is what Jesus had. 
right? So Buddha's vision, what he see on a person, what he see when he look outside, it's not the same thing what we, you and I see. Right? So that's the divine vision. How you get that divine vision is through the Samyama. Then, so basically, okay, uh, I'll take a nice example, right? Imagine you are eating a cake, right? Now imagine the, the most, I mean, uh, the cake that you like. So I'll explain a cake that I like. It's called jaggery cake. It's made, made out of jaggery. It's not very expensive. It's just 400 or 500 rupees. It's already there in Pera and Sons or some Kiel supermarket, right? So this cake is this size, right? It's dark in color and um, it's like puffed out really nice. And then when you cut it, you can see the jaggery, uh, the juice kind of thing is, you know, even the uh, this one, the knife gets the whole juice, right? And when you eat, when you take it to your hand, it's very heavy, right? Very heavy. And when you eat it even, it has a, like a darker chocolate smell and kind of like uh, the jaggery and a little bit of honey and a little bit of sweetness and a little bit of hardness. How is that cake? Did you all eat it already? How is that cake? Is it tasty? Right? So that cake is nice, right? So whenever you're visiting me, you bring me that cake. Okay? So that cake is very nice. It's very heavy. It's very rich. And when you eat that cake, you can go into sleep for hours. Because it actually toxifies you. Right? Now, imagine you are eating this. Now everybody ate that cake. Right? It's right, nice, right? Yeah? Now, imagine... I give you a piece of my cake, not a big one, a small one, right? Because I like it very much. I have a big value to that cake, okay? So I give you a little piece and I give you a, a nice silver color um, fork and a nice plate, right? So now you are sitting on a nice table and then you are eating, right? So when you take a bite and put it inside your mouth, now you are enjoying that, right? Now, while you are enjoying, what is running in your head now? Tell me, what is running in your head? The beautiful looking, the juicy cake. Isn't it? So that's what you are eating right now, right? But do you understand what the, the taste that you feel is? Some cake went inside your mouth. And the whole saliva mix with that and then mix, mix, mix and then little by little you eat, right? So you have the cake as the cake outside your mouth. It looks beautiful, right? But while you are eating, if somebody just ah, open your mouth and show this is the cake, this is so beautiful, would it be beautiful? No. But at that moment, that is what actually happening. Inside your mouth, the process, if you see, maybe you haven't even washed your mouth in the morning, right? And everything else is there in your mouth. And now a cake went, mm, so good, right? So what in your head, what you think is the nice packaged, beautiful cake in the freezer coming to me and now I'm eating that, right? But what is actually happening is you can't even look at it. And moments after it goes in the canal and then it goes to your uh, digestive system and it will go through certain things and once you excrete it, you will not even want to not even look at, right? So that's why you have a flush on your closet. Right? Immediately, oof, get out. That's the reality, right? So basically, you must, I'm not saying whenever you are eating, you need to now think about that, right? You should not think about that. But understand the reality. Learn the reality. Even though right now, right now, one organ is chewing, right? And eye is seeing, 
right? Looking at the residual of your cake, right? The remaining part of uh, your cake on the plate. And while you are chewing with saliva and everything, maybe you had a tea sometime back and some drink and you maybe smoke, everything running inside your mouth. But your mind is thinking, ooh, this is heaven. Hell is just a couple of inches down. Right? So, this is what you call as the delusion. So, you need to understand the reality of it. That's why they say for yogis, you eat to survive a body. Right? So, when you put some uh, food inside your mouth, it will do certain stuff and then it will sustain your body. It will give you energy. It will make you sustain. Right? So, understand that reality and eat it. Right? So, uh, also Patanjali says, now when you get the superior hearing, when you get the superior touch, the vision, right, the taste, smell and all, what we, so in the next sutra itself, Patanjali is giving a caution. Hey, look here. When you get this, now you will sit somewhere and you will start to talk what is happening behind you. Right? So when these powers yogis gain, they basically, this is the best point where they deviate. There are people, no, whenever they, you walk into a room, they know, okay, you came for this, you are this one, this one, you have a problem in your mind like this, you were like this in the So some people can acquire, some people can cheat, most people can cheat, some people can acquire those, uh, this thing, but Patanjali says, these things are actually obstacles or impediments to your samadhi. Right? You have not reached samadhi. You are reaching and you have got a byproduct or a middle situation. Right? Don't get deviated and take that route down. Right? Again, about that also, you need to see like your CCTV. Now the CCTV is showing, right? The consciousness or the witness is showing this is what is happening. But you do not get deviated with that. Right? Good. Then we will go to the next slide as well. So through relaxation of the causes of bondage and the free flow of consciousness. So I'm talking about few words, not me. I'm talking about, sorry, Patanjali talks about few words, right? Through relaxation of the causes of bondage and the free flow of consciousness, the yogi enters another body, another's body at will, right? So, uh, read. There is a nice story. That's the story um, about Adi Shankaracharya entering the body of uh, Mandana Mishra. Right? So, there was a person called Mandana Mishra, and then Adi Shankaracharya was there. Right? So, they were in uh, two different Adi Shankaracharya is Advaita, the other one is on Puru Mimamsa. Right? Yeah. So they had an argument, right? About which philosophy is good and all. So I'm not going to tell the story. You need to understand it. So it says how Adi Shankaracharya is an example, entered another person's body. Right? So it's like in Singhala, we say Manokaya. Right? You basically leave your body and you enter somebody's body. So when we die. In simple, let's try to understand this. Let's not think too complicated, right? When we die, what is meant by die? Your heart stops, right? And your consciousness is gone, right? If you look at a dead body, everything is there. Now, if you take look at my dead body, right? So I'm like all active right now. So one day I'll be like this, right? Dead. I'll make sure my face looks like this, right? So that's the last bit. Okay. So, so basically what is missing from a living point to a dead point is your consciousness. It's like a car is there, functioning car, non-functioning car. What is missing is the electricity in the car. Can the electricity be touched? You can't, right? So when a person dies, if this consciousness moves out from the body, when you are living, if you are superly conscious, can't you do that? You should be able to, right? I don't know, but you should be able to. 
But that's what ancient yogis are saying. So, there is a story where Adi Shankaracharya entered a king's body to get an experience so that he can answer somebody and uh, win the argument. Right? Read, read this story. When I uh, share this, I just say, uh, it, it says, Para Kaya Pravesha. Pravesha is entering. Para is outside. Kaya is body. Somebody else's body. Right? So even um, in these stories, they say if you have a very weak soul, um, certain atmas will enter, enter your body. Right? If you have a weak soul, right? if you have a superior soul, all these weak souls can't enter your body. Right? So normally, um, yeah, we should not go there. Right? All this toiler and all these things, right? they say a god came into your body. God is much superior than a human. God will not come inside a human's body. Only a samperete or something like that will come to a human body. Right? But that particular thing is bodiless. So you can send the soul in different, different ways. Right? Do your own research on that. Right? So I'm not quoting anything. Right? So, um, so it is said that, you know, Adi Shankaracharya had the ability to enter to somebody else's body. So he was so conscious, he was so conscious about his consciousness, right? So he can actually lift his Atman out of his body and then he can uh, go to another person's body. So this particular story says this particular king was about to die. So Adi Shankaracharya, he left his body and went into the king's body. But then after some time when the king is behaving very differently, everybody understood there's something wrong has happened. Then the whole city was searched for dead bodies. Right? Just to find out. Then Adi Shankarajara understood, okay, if I stay like this, there is a possibility that my original body will be gone. Right? So then he left the body. So there's a nice story. Please read it. Right? Good. So... Uh, so I'm I'm actually I'm actually not aware about not really sure about how these you know uh, in this uh, toiler and all these things how they say a person entered into somebody's this thing um, so if at all for that to happen that person has to be a super conscious being right good then they say uh, Patanjali says in the fortieth sutra by mastery of Udanavayu, the yogi can walk over water swamps and thrones without touching them. Uh, he can also levitate. He can, right? He can also levitate, meaning just like float. So, what Patanjali is trying to tell here is okay. yeah, so by mastery of the Udanavayu, where is Udanavayu? Udanavayu, so we have our Pranavayu it has been divided into different different segments. Where the where the vayu is operating, where the prana is operating, we call it udana samana likewise, right? So he says, when you can, uh, so udana vayu is I think up here, right? From here and upwards, the prana vayu, right? So when you actually focus here, you can actually lose the weight. You can actually reduce the weight of your body. You can lift up your weight. What is weight? If there is a, a weighting scale, when you stand on it, so a particular mass is there, gravity is there, so the gravity is pulling and that's what you call as weight. Right? So, if the gravity is not pulling, would it have a weight? Can you see the gravity? Can, has anybody seen the gravity? Right? So, there is a way that you can even control the gravity. And then, your the, if you put a weight scale here, your weight will start to reduce, 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 reduce and reduce. Right? So, when your weight reduces what happens, even though you look like a big person, you will start to float. Right? That's how these monks walk on the water. That's how these monks just walk on the trees walk on the sky, right? So even they say in certain places, in Himalayas, Myanmar and all these places, there are monks you can see like either they are creating an illusion in your head or they are actually walking. 
but whatever we see we don't know whether it's true or not right good then by samyama on samana vayu a yogi glows like fire and his aura shines meaning samana vayu is beyond uh, sorry down here from throat down right so this uh, chest region so when you focus on that particular prana vayu in your body you can control the temperature of your body that's why i put this picture here so there are an ample number of yogis who are meditating in the himalayas i have been telling this story from the beginning right and they don't they wear very light clothes they wear very you know cotton kind of very light clothes but they don't die because of uh, um, cold so if there are any people who are going to any cold places cold countries you can actually learn this technique to bring your samyama on the samana vayu right so you can control the body temperature it's not a joke out of jokes right so these are the super powers of yogis so where is this now when you say super powers and everything so if you look at a super hero movie and all so the power has come from somewhere else power has come from an external body right but the spiritual power comes inside right so you have like a you have the layers of the body right we have the food body then we have the pranic body we have the vijnanamay body likewise we have the anandamay body right so you basically first of all you overcome the food body right so a person who overcome the food body doesn't look at his body as an instrument it's not something to show off right body is a body body is a vehicle that's it right so then so basically you come come through to your consciousness right so when you come to your consciousness a person a yogi sitting down closing his eyes right he is not focusing on his body the element of body has been lost even when you do anapanasati meditation at a point you will realize so when you are here now you are inhaling and exhaling now you start to like rotate sometimes you feel like your body has now been rotated oh you don't know which direction you are focusing right now so basically little by little you are being taken out from the body part of it right so you you keep some focus so when you in that focus the body doesn't become a thing anymore you go beyond the body so even this person if he is a yogi even though he is there right now um, he may not be there right so some people feel in anapanasati meditation some people feel like fainting and some people now they have actually their physical body has fainted and it's on the floor but the person doesn't know that sometimes somebody hit the head but the person doesn't know that right these are these are evidenced even in meditation centers right some people cry but when they conscious when they are like putting the focus into something keep on pouring tears and not when they open their eyes only they are saying okay what has happened have i cried right so the samyama it's important so yama niyama asana pranayama pratyahara yama niyama are the basic foundation asana is the discipline that you do so asana is some it's equivalent to like a kaya gatasati or kaya anupassana right whenever you do a movement you have a movement you have the breath right and you are in fully awareness on what you are doing right we are not doing yoga to show off somebody we are not doing yoga to wear some clothes and say you know i did this and that's 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 just entertainment right so you you can practice the mindfulness through yoga asana right sit on your yoga mat sit on your own place try to concentrate for few minutes then you do your own yoga asana whatever the yoga asana it is even just hands up hands down hands up hands down but you exactly focus on it right you are fully in control of your breath you are fully in awareness of your movement and that's all what you do nothing else right so those are techniques you can actually start the mindfulness right and then comes the pranayama part of it 
So the pranic energy at the end of the day, when you inhale, although you feel like you inhaled a wind inside, what are you inhaling? Do we, we can call it oxygen. So that is a nama, right? Nama to a rupa that we don't even know, right? Nama is the oxygen. So you can put that name. But what are you inhaling actually? It's an energy form, right? So if you don't inhale, right? And let's say there is some wind has been thrown to you. Let's say um, helium or something. Right, you are in a room of helium. Will you survive? But still, it's like a wind. You are inhaling it and exhaling it. Inhaling, exhaling. So, a particular element in the air we inhale and it gives us energy. So, when you even go into deeper steps in Anapanasati meditation, you inhale and exhale. First, you feel like, okay, okay, if this is the part that I'm focusing on, some wind went in, wind went out, wind went in, wind went out, right? Then after some point, you need to properly focus on the start of this wind, starting point of the wind. If you focus on the starting point of the wind, you will realize it's not even a wind. There's no wind. You are basically, it's like this uh, kinetic energy and the, uh, the still energy, static and the kinetic, right? So static is there, you take it in and then it becomes the kinetic. Then you can move everything, right? It's an energy that energy form that you're inhaling and exhaling, right? Then after some point you will realize, so that's an energy form. So you and that energy form are the same. Right? So this is a point where if your body is not properly balanced and set, the body will just fall. Right? So there are amazing things that you can do with yoga. Right? The spiritual journey, the inside journey is a journey. It's a promising journey. Right? So it's important right now we are in the verge of even um, completing chapter number three. Then we will do chapter number four as well. Then we will stop the session. After that, we will take a couple of sessions to give an overall idea. But then we will stop the session. Right? And stopping the session, no point you being able to explain everything to somebody. Even us not being explained anything to anybody is good if we practice. If the practice is there, sometimes you go out of words to explain. Because now if somebody asks, what is Samadhi? What is Nirvana? What is Moksha? Words are not there to explain that experience. If somebody asks, what is love? Right? You love somebody, how does it feel? Only you can say, when the person is around me, I feel so good. And I like the smell of the person. And I like to hold the hand. And when I hold the hand, I feel like, you know, I have hold the hand of the world. <laughs> right? So, those are all words. But what exactly it is, still nobody can, uh, can explain. Now, what is the feeling a mother feels about the child? Explain it. You can't explain it. What is the feeling you have on your mother? Why you cry sometimes? You can't explain it. Right? When your mother or father dies, when your child or your spouse, somebody dies, you go rootless. Right? If somebody asks, you give a base word called depression. Right? Explain what is depression. Right? So if you can't explain depression, if you can't explain what is love, can you explain what is chitta consciousness? Can you explain what is nirvana, what is moksha? At least these are things people in everyday ex experience. The sadness, sorrow, all these things people experience. Still you can't explain it. Put yourself in a situation, right? Try to understand, why am I feeling bad? Why so many thoughts are going in my head? What is going on? Why do I feel bad? Right? Why, why, why? You can't explain it. Right? So words are like a small subset. You can't explain a superset from a subset. 
right? Good. Are we good, guys? Yeah. Did I confuse you enough? Yes. Good. Then uh, that that's better, right? Okay. So uh, go through these again and again. Find a book on your own. Find a book on your own language. Read articles. Read the experiences of other people. At least try to get a mental image about what this is. How does it feel in Anapanasati meditation? How does it feel in other meditations, right? Then you, when whenever you are progressing, you know, right? When you are watching your mind, you know, okay, this is where I'm reaching, right? Otherwise, nobody is going to ask any question about Patanjali Yoga Sutra or Buddhism or anything. You being not able to explain everything is perfectly fine. The importance is you being able to practice and experience, right? Okay, so we will stop from here. If you have any questions, you can, we will discuss quickly. Otherwise, give me a call, right? Okay, so hands in namaskaram. Inhale. Exhale. Deep inhalation and exhalation. So, uh,